Good morning. It's uh, my great pleasure to briefly introduce Rabbi Daniel Berg, who most of you know very well. Um, uh, but I'll just add some particulars that you might not have known about, which I didn't know about from his extensive bio on the website with a lovely bow tie. I'm sorry he didn't favor us with the bow tie this morning, but maybe that's the fancy <laughs> picture he uses for, for outsiders, you know. Um, uh, so uh, Rabbi Berg has been with us um, 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 since uh, 2010, now the Alexander Grass Rabbinic Chair. He was at Anshayim in Chicago, ordained at the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies at the University of Judaism, and now, now American Jewish Universities. He has two master's degrees, one in rabbinic studies and one in Jewish education, and he went to Wisconsin where they eat cheese. Um, he <laughs> is a senior fellow of the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem and served on the Maryland Task Force of Reconciliation Equity, one of many things he's done which is relevant to um, his teaching today. He's widely published, the Post, the Sun Times, um, the Baltimore Sun, uh, many other places in uh, on national um, and local media outlets. He's uh, participated in two edited volumes, um, written widely. I haven't mentioned uh, a, a third or a tenth of his references and pu publications. Um, what he's done, again, relevant to his tour today, is to articulate a vision of community engagement um, as part of Beth Am's vision. Um, including um, the New Jewish Neighborhood Project and in for of um, as you know, 501c3, which is affiliated with Beth Am. He serves on a number of boards, um, including the Logic Cummings Youth Program, the Maryland Zoo, and uh, the Institute for Islamic Christian and Jewish Studies, and on the board of IFO. He was on the uh, board of Jews United for Justice until 2018. And as you know, he's been very vocal and an effective advocate, both in Baltimore and Annapolis for very, various important issues, which are near and dear to the hearts of all of us, including police reform, um, marriage equality, um, environmental justice, and gun control. And I, I am very honored to, to bring him to the podium. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Zach. I've also read, led a few services in this very space. <laughs> Nice to be learning. We call this space our Beit Midrash. Um, the vision of the space was always that it would be a, a multimodal gathering spot um, for Tfilot, but also for, for, for learning. So it's really a joy to be learning. And I just want to give a shout out to our continuing education committee and to Melissa Gear, who have done such a wonderful job of um, uh, conceptualizing this program. Zach Berger was uh, kind of a thought leader in putting this together as well. And um, really grateful, you know, you, you try something and you don't know if the time slot's gonna work and if the content's gonna work. And I feel like there's been a real proof of concept with this Locks and Learn breakfast. So thanks everybody for making this happen. Uh, so I've been thinking recently, I've been working on a book project and attempting to identify some of the core texts that inform my own understanding of relational justice, right? That is the justice of encounter that I would argue undergirds other facets of justice work like volunteerism, service, advocacy, and so on. So um, what I'd like to do is take us through four key texts, key justice texts, not like the four key justice texts in our tradition. There are other books that have done a good job of identifying like what are the, the core sources that deal with Tzedek, but these are sources that I keep coming back to, some of which I've taught um, here at Beth Am um, and or I've written about, but that I feel help as, as guideposts along the journey toward a justice of encounter. So I wanna start with two, um, two brief quotes. The first from Amanda Gorman, who read the magnificent poem at the Biden inauguration. When the day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry, the sea we must wade. We brave the belly of the beast, we've learned that quiet isn't always peace and the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. Uh, and I wanna set that kind of in conversation for a moment with Richard Pryor's routine, uh, where he said, you go down there looking for justice and that's where what you find, just us. Um, I won't do the rest of the routine, which, which has not held up well, uh, but I, I think that that line 
uh, is instructive because what, what both of them are identifying is that we often fall prey to a certain sense of inertia um, or assumptions about what it is to actually bring justice into the world. So Gorman observes that, uh, that the status quo and justice are, are not necessarily in sync. And Richard Pryor um, uh, mentions that uh, too often uh, in an attempt to bring about justice, what is really happening is one group is imposing its will on another group, right? We're saying this, seeing this kind of in, in sharp relief in Israel right now. Um, certainly this is the story in many ways of this country too. So what I want to point us toward as we um, dive into four sources this morning is what I organized around kind of the four T's of relational justice work. Um, and I call it the four T's rather than using the Hebrew letters because in Hebrew, the letters are different. <laughs> but in English, they're all T. So <laughs> therefore, it works for my argument. Um, so can I get, I want to do actually the first one in Chavruta, um, and, but let's read it together and then I'd like to spend a few minutes discussing it. Can I get a volunteer? How is this working, Melissa? If people read, should we pass a mic? So no, they can, can it's ah, actually pretty well picked up. Here from the saucer. By, yes. Okay, great. Um, so I want to read, this is from Kirkia Votes which is a Masechet, it's a tractate of the Mishnah, so a uh, beginning of third century text from Eretz Yisrael. There are four types of character in human beings. One that says, mine is mine and yours is yours. This is an average type. And some say this is a Sodom type of character. One that says, mine is yours and yours is mine is an unyearned person, an artist. One that says, mine is yours and yours is yours is a pious person. One that says, mine is mine and yours is mine is a wicked person. Great. So I'm less interested in the, the final three categories, the final three midot. I'm actually more interested in the first midah, right? So it says, Omer sheli sheli v'shelach or shelcha shelach. Zo midat benonit. So the one who says what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours, that's either an average way of being in the world or it's midat stom. This is a sort of sodomite way of being in the world. So what I want to do is take five minutes in Chabruta, find, find a partner, folks on Zoom, maybe you can talk amongst yourself if that works, um, and just see if you can unpack that first uh, Mida, that first quality, what about this quality leads to any disagreement, right? What, what's, what's, uh, why does one camp say that this is average? And why does one sa camp say that this is actually deeply problematic? So take, a, take about five minutes and we'll come back together. <laughs>
Gut. Okay, so let's finish the last thought. So what I want to suggest is that there is a fundamental linkage between possession and justice. In other words, part of the way that we notice and are attentive to issues of justice in the world is to ask questions about who has, who doesn't have, and how is having brought about in this world. So I'm curious around the issue of tzedek, my first T, what did you discuss for the first midah? Um, why are there two different opinions and what, what's the worth of either, either perspective? Yeah, exactly. So the, the first midah and the first uh, quality is about the violence of the status quo. It doesn't matter how much I have or how much you have. What matters is that there's sort of an assigned package of goods that you might have more and I might have less, but it doesn't matter. That's the way it is. And not only is it the way it is, but because the comparison is, is to stone, it's to Sodom, we know it's a, it's a status quo of violence. Great. Can you say another word about why is it related to, like, how does the example of Sodom uh, equate to status quo violence? Because the, the rabbis understand that what happened in Sodom was a society in which people were so satisfied with what they have, and satisfied with what they have, and re rejected violently any incursion of outside egalitarian thoughts into their sphere. Um, and that is what led to you know, the violent end of, of Sodom and God's putting an end to it. Yeah, Miriam. Read strictly, it kind of pulls out any communitarian concerns, any notion for concern for like baseline of needs that allow people to be functional. Um, and this notion that what's mine is mine, but I didn't have any help getting it. Um, so to me, that's where it can be connected to the, the Sodom landscape. Great, thanks. Any other thoughts? Yeah, Ben? Yeah, I think, I think rabbis also argue that because it was a land of abundance, Sodom had, Sodom had a lot of um, silver, had a lot of water, had a, had a lot of things that they believed that was supposed to then withhold from others. Um, and since it belonged to God, it, it became this form of idolatry that created the status quo in society of people being able to give to others when it wasn't theirs to have in the first place. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Bonnie? You were also talking about that when mine is mine and yours is yours, there's no community because you contribute something, I contribute, and together what we might have is a richer something, mm -hmm. whether it's ideas or things that combine in different ways. Great. And that's, that's a beautiful segue into the second source that I want to look at. So I think, I think we've also heard here is that in a way, the first opinion in the Mishnah is sort of a straw man for the second opinion, right? Like, I don't think the text is saying it's really an average. I think it's saying the average is actually quite dangerous if we think about it. And, uh, and we're looking for something more uh, collaborative, more relational um, at its core. And that's what the second text, I think, is about. Um, Sedaka in Hebrew is the word for charity, but of course, charity has a different root, right? Caritas uh, um, has more to do with generosity. Sedaka is rooted, of course, in the concept of justice. So Sedaka for us is about making sure that um, no one uh, goes without basic needs met. And if they do, that's not a failure of the people who have to be adequately generous. That's a failure of society to uh, take care of uh, its uh, more vulnerable populations, okay? So we're gonna look at essentially a ju another justice text, but that's about the specific uh, modality of justice, which is tzedakah. Tzedakah meaning uh, uh, providing resources to the poor. So I'm, we're actually going to read through this twice. 
can I get a volunteer to read through it once? And then we're actually going to try to act this out. <laughs> yes, Jock. Jock. Yes. In regard to transferring on Shabbat, there are two basic actions that comprise four cases. Excuse me, we don't have audio anymore. Hello, is that better? Much, thank you. Thank you. Okay, please, very good. Uh, the poor person stands outside and the homeowner stands inside. One, the poor person lifted an object in the public domain, extended his hand into the private domain, and placed the object into the hand of the homeowner. Two, or took and transferred it out into the public domain. In both of these cases, the poor person is liable and the homeowner is dead. One, the homeowner extended his hand into and placed the object into the hand of the poor person. To or took an object from the hand of the poor person and transferred it into the private domain. In both of those cases, the homeowner is liable and the poor person is exempt. There are four additional cases. One, the poor person extended his hand into the private domain, private domain and either the homeowner took an object from his hand, or two, the homeowner placed an object into the hand of the poor person, and the poor person transferred the object out into the public domain. Both of them are exempt. Three, in the case the homeowner extended his hand into the public domain, and either the poor person took an object from the homeowner's hand, or four, the poor person placed an object into the homeowner's hand, and the homeowner transferred the object into the private domain. In all of these cases, both of them are exempt. Okay. Feeling a little dizzy? <laughs> so that's the last. Um, what's at the, so first of all, what does this mean, uh, liable or exempt? And it says chayav, or it says, um, it's a pator. So it's, it, okay, so it does have to do with breaking the Shabbos rules, okay? And what's the difference between somebody being chayav, that is liable, and somebody being pator, being exempt? Yes. He's subject to punishment. Yeah, you're subject to punishment. We don't need to talk about the specific punishment, but, but you're subject to punishment, okay? Um, uh, and what is, um, uh, so at the heart of, the concern here is what? What is the text most concerned about? Who did understanding? <laughs> who did what specifically? Okay, so who's acting? Which so there are two parties. There's the Balhabait and there's the Ani, right? So there's the resident of the home, could be an owner, it could be a renter, but it's like whoever lives in that domicile. 
And then there's someone who's coming to the door who needs help, right? Um, uh, ostensibly. So what, what is the concern of the text? You were gonna say something? No, I was just saying who the, you said you asked what's the main point is yeah. who is, the, it's kind of like who's acting or who's being acted upon. Okay, so there's who's acting, who is a passive participant right. in the drama kind of and great. And what do you think the text is most concerned about, mm -hmm. right? Why, why does the text, text even exist in the first place? Intention? Yeah, it's, it's part of it is about intention, but it's not just about intention, I think. Yeah. Is it about the, the act of Sadaka during the Sabbath, but um, whether or not that's, you know, how, how does one approach being uh, uh, helpful to somebody in, in that sense. Great. So I think, right, so I think it's fascinating that the very first text of Masechet Shabbat is really not concerned about Shabbat. It's concerned about what do you do when you have 25 hours that you might not be able to feed the hungry, mm -hmm. right? What do you do, right? And we're probably not talking about money because money is the seven. We're probably talking about food, some sort of an in-kind support, here, um, but what do you do when somebody needs and you have a set of rules that proscribe um, the ability of someone to give to someone else, right? That's a problem. Now, the A-Roof issue kind of makes all this go away. If you live in an A-Roof, you can transfer and it's not a problem, but we're assuming that there's not an A-Roof and they may not, you know, the concept of A-Roofing sort of develops over time, um, but so we're just assuming that there's a private domain and a public domain. Yeah, Mir. Yeah. Are both people are active. Great. Whereas they prohibited one, one person is doing something to the other. Yeah, great. So let's let's actually for the visual learners among us, let's see if we can actually act this out, um, which might make it clearer. Uh, and do I have a volunteer who wants to be the bala bite? Who wants to be the the homeowner? Bonnie? Yeah. Okay. Come on up. Come on up. <laughs> I mean, you volunteered. Okay. Uh, who would like to be the ani? Who wants to be the poor person? Okay, David. Come on up. All right. So bala bite. What's that? Okay. So. Well, that's okay. That's what we're going to do. All right. So you're going to stand. Do I need to bring my instructions? Yeah. Why don't you come over here? So, David, you are going to be, this is your home. Bonnie, come over here. Oh, David, you stand on this side. Okay. And you stand right here. Stand in front of the podium. Okay. We're going to need Carol Burke out to direct here. Am I in the house okay. What's that? Am I inside or you're outside? You're outside. Uh, no, you're, you're the Balabai. You're inside the house. Okay. So here's the house. This podium, stand on the other side of the podium, if you would. This okay. podium now represents the, let's just say the window, okay? Oh, okay? We'll say it's a window, could be a door, but fine. It's a window, it's a kitchen window. David is coming to the window. Bonnie is in her kitchen, hanging out, eating breakfast, whatever. And David comes, Making okay? Bagels, right? So as we all, we all learned from everything everywhere all at once that bagels are super important. We're gonna use, we're gonna use a bagel to demonstrate, okay? okay? All right, so the first one is, the poor person is outside, the homeowner stands inside. That's gonna be sort of the case through all of these. The poor person lifted an object in the public domain, extended her hand into the private domain, placed the object into the hand of the homeowner, okay? So we're just gonna kind of leave aside for a second, like what, oh, I'm sorry. David, my apologies. Okay. So, so I would say, why would what why would there be a scenario where the poor person is sort of um, reaching into give to the homeowner? It could be an empty container. Ah, so maybe yeah, the there's like filling it up. Great. So maybe there's an empty container yeah. which you're putting in. Maybe this is sort of like a barter. Maybe it's <laughs> but whatever it is, right? Already we it's were sort of that. challenging. <laughs> What's that? This is my empty container. Well, oh, the empty container. There you go. Okay, great. So the poor person lifted an object in, in the public domain, extended her hand into the private domain. Go ahead and do it. And place the object into the hand of the oh, home. No, no, just take the plate. Take the plate. Right? 
Or who's the Ani? Who's the poor person? Yeah. Okay. So the poor person has the object, right? Extends the hand into the private domain, right? right? Okay. Where's the Where's the private domain? Right. That's your home, right? Okay. And place the object not, into the hand of the homeowner. Got we're it? not doing okay. anything with the bagel yet. Right. I have a, I have a <laughs> there you go. Okay. Second, or took and transferred it out of the public domain. Okay. So now I'll go back to the public domain. Okay. And now you, the Ani, are there you go. Took it and transferred it. In both cases, the Ani, the poor person, is the one who is hayav, right? The one who is liable, and the homeowner is exempt. Why? He did all the action. Great, because he did all of the action. Okay, you were sort of a passive participant in this. Okay, now let's let's switch it up. The homeowner extended her hand. Homeowner extended her hand and placed the object into the hand of the poor person okay so you might if you want to use the plate you could hold the plate but either way you're going to place it into the hand of the poor person or took the object from the hand of the poor person and transferred it into the private domain in this case right both of these cases the homeowner is liable and the poor person is exempt why because the homeowner is the one who's active and the ani is passive okay great so here are the four additional cases. Okay, each in each of these cases, both of them, so either both of them are liable and both of them are exempt. And then we're going to ask, like, why is it that in the end both of them are exempt, not both of them are liable? Okay. So in in four additional cases, the poor person extended uh, his hand into the private domain, and either the homeowner took an object from his hand. Right, so here we go. There, so he's extending. There you go. Okay, I don't know why, why not the bagel, but fine. The plate, so that she can. Oh, because she can put yeah. now put the bagel into the plate. Okay. Put the bagel or, on the podium. <laughs> or the homeowner placed an object into the hand of the poor person, and the poor person transferred the object out into the public domain. Put the bagel on the plate. <laughs> homeowner placed an object into the hand. Frame. Okay. Okay, and. Or here's the third one. In a case where the homeowner extended her hand into the public domain, and either the poor person took an object from the homeowner's hand. So now, yeah, so you've got to so hold the bagel or something, right? So you're giving the bagel, and now, right, you take it, right? Which is different from if you just put your hand out and place it into his hand, he actually did something active to take it. Or the poor person placed an object into the homeowner's hand, and the homeowner transferred the object into the public, into the private domain. Got it? Okay. And all of these cases both are exempt. All right. All right. How about a round of applause for? Anybody want a bagel? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We'll be burning that bagel. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So. <laughs> Okay, so so why do we, so we already identified that there's there's active and there's passive, and we already said something about being collaborative here, and I wanna just ask for a moment, why do you think the Mishnah is interested in a somehow a collaborative act of tzedakah, and, and also why then, if it's collaborative, why isn't this, they both go down together, right? Why they, they shared the guilt, so therefore both of them are guilty. Instead, they share the guilt, so both of them are innocent. Now, Pator doesn't quite mean innocent. I mean, there's actually kind of less of a moral valence to this, but 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 it's 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 not like permissible, it's not like the same thing as Pator, but it just means like you're not liable for any penalty. Okay, so why is it, do you think, that both of them are pator and not that both of them are guilty, are high off? You make rules that, that work. Yeah. If the rule doesn't work, then you have to change the rule. If somebody is hungry, you're going to want to feed them. Great. So for you, you, you uh-huh. 
take something, give them something so they can say, take it home to their family. So for you, the, this text is primarily concerned not about being Shomer Shabbos, but about fulfilling the mitzvah of feeding the poor. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Other people are interacting for not for personal reasons, but I'm asking. You're saying I'm offered. So the offering and the asking, um, the in exchange are comparable, and they're both saying you, you know, we're both going to get a mitzvah out of this. Mm -hmm. So maybe even like more affirmatively, it's not just like we got away with it, yeah. right? Yeah. Like maybe the subtext of this is actually we did something holy, right? And collaboratively. Uh -huh. and, and the way we were able to do it while still honoring, right, the very important laws of Shabbat is to do it collaboratively. Yeah. I feel like there's an element of consent there as well. Like mm -hmm. say I'm so pious that I can't do it out my window. Right, so that both parties are participating and saying that it's okay, right, as opposed to me imposing my notion of, and I know it's all the rules of that, what I'm saying doesn't even count, but I still feel yeah. that element of consent. In agency, in a way, right? Like I think also the agency of both parties here, right? That's I love that. There's a text that in in the Gemara that I didn't bring, but that I have taught at Beth on before about. Um, a blind person carrying a torch. And the question is like, why is this blind person walking around with a torch at night? Because the poor torch isn't really going to allow him to see anything any better. And the answer is that when the blind person carries the torch, um, other people see the torch and can warn her about pits or briars or obstacles. Right. So but who carries the torch? Right. You could say the town is responsible for all walking around with torches. Uh, right. Having good illumination. And that's that's not a bad solution. But what's interesting about the text is it actually places also the the uh, the torch in the hand of the blind person, giving that person some agency. Right. You know, I um, uh, I have uh, gone to visit people who are less able uh, homes, hospitals. One of the things you learn when you're training for chaplaincy, pastoral work, um, home visits, hospital visits is like never do for someone what they can do for themselves, even if you could do it quicker or better or easier because like all you're doing is removing their ability to take care of themselves or maybe even take care of you. Yeah. I was trying to think about this in the modern context, and, and what came to mind was uh, the protest a couple summers ago, the Black Lives Matter protest, mm -hmm. where uh, where the people who were uh, oppressed with the black people, and then the number of white people who don't have that experience joined together and broke a law for mm -hmm. local ordinances about gathering, about or uh, impl implemented laws to prevent people from being out. At, at night, the curfews and such that that you know it's uh, it's for a higher purpose, and thus it is okay in the eyes of God. Great. I mean, it's like right. Is there something in this text about civil disobedience? Right. Uh, that's a, that's yeah. why at this moment. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah, Ben, and then Rob Tyler. Yeah, I was thinking similarly in, in the sense that the previous text, when you have a Saddam mentality. That means that there are poor people and people who are rich, and that that's that's a that's a world that is dominated by a Saddam mentality. Mm -hmm. This is this text seems to be accepting that that is a reality that we're living in a Saddam mentality, um, and you can't just reimagine a world by thinking about it. So it's mm -hmm. creating that that space for for the dignity that you just described but also for somebody giving up some sense of autonomy and, and authority in, in allowing them for a shared space for the both exempt. Right. So Thank you. Yeah. I think that the, the, the great money of definition of what it's the I were carrying is like kashrut. It's like if you eat pork, you know, it goes into your mouth, like then you violated kashrut. We might have thought of Carrying that it's if something goes over that threshold, it is that's all that's what it is. And the things we say 
it's not it's not really about things going over the threshold it's about a unidirectional transfer from one person to the other and it's like it, it, i think it changes what the violation it's saying the violation isn't just about crossing the thresholds but how it's done it seems like the mm -hmm. the primary thing that they're forbidding is not the crossing but the one person imposing their will on the other on shabbat that that kind of domination even if it's for a good purpose is antithetical to what what shabbat consciousness is great great i love it all right so let's let's move to the third text um, this comes from the Bavli, from the Babylonian Talmud, Masachet Gitin, um, which is about divorce. But if you know anything about the Talmud, just because the title of the tractate is one thing doesn't mean that everything within that tractate necessarily deals directly with that topic. So we're not really looking, I mean, one could read it that way, but right here, it's not really important to be talking about divorce. Um, uh, and I, the question that undergirds this text, as we look at not just uh, tzedek and sadaka, but now tikkun, my third T, is what if the injustice has already occurred, right? Not, not what if you're trying to avoid injustice, right? But you're, they're like, there is an injustice and maybe even a, a substantial injustice has occurred. What do you do after the fact, okay? So, who wants to read this one? Yes, thanks, Zach. The sages taught in a Brita, if one robbed another of a beam and built it into a building, Beit Shammai say he must destroy the entire building and return the beam to its owners. And Beit Hillel say the injured party receives only the value of the beam and not the beam itself due to an ordinance instituted for the sake of the penitent. Okay. So Mishum Takanata Shavim, right? And uh, the, the word Takana from the word Tikkun to repair. Sometimes we hear Tikkun Olam. I'm actually not a huge fan of the term, mostly because I think it's actually not a useful term the way that we uh, we use it. But that's that's a that's a class for another day. Um, there is definitely, I think, a very strong sense of Takana that undergirds the halachic process and Jewish thought in general. And here's the question is, what does repair look like in a situation where someone has stolen from another? So someone steals a beam and then they use the beam to build a building. Now the building exists, what do you do? And Bait Shammai says, look, the entire building is built on this, this you know, uh, uh, tainted um, act of theft. You can't unmake the taint of the theft unless you unmake the building. So you dismantle the building and you take the beam and you give it back to the owner. And Beit Hillel says um, that, that we're not gonna do that. You just have to pay the person for the value of the beam. So I'm curious, what does this say to you about how to how to respond to earlier injustice. Oh, it, it seems to be, um, if, if you're a fan of the Hillel, that there's a, um, that destruction or vengeance in the process of seeking justice is, is problematic. Mm -hmm. Right, if you're going to destroy something in order to see justice, what I'm curious that about because I think this obviously ties into thinking about reparations in our own time. Right. Is what about admitting that you are at fault? <laughs> whatever, whatever the next step is, there seems to be that first step of saying, "Yeah, I still will be." <laughs> yeah, great, and, and there are a whole series of discussions both in this tract and in other places about this issue and dealing with other issues and. And right, so so like there's another piece of the story, which is also just the admitting of fault itself. Great, others, yeah. yeah and by making it monetary value, it's, it's recognizing that the, the eye for an eye mentality isn't always an equal one. That, that, like I chop off LeBron James's arm. Chopping off my arm is not actually going to have the same effect. I can still presumably do what I do without an arm. Right, 
whereas he loses hundreds of millions of dollars. And so rather than probably still dunk on you, but <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll give him that. Hey, man. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so that so that by by putting a monetary value, it actually in, in some way might um, prevent me from wanting to do that because it might be worth my sacrificing my arm if I really like don't want him to succeed. Or, so and so like with a beam that's already had a house built around it, we don't it's it's doing more destruction to the people who are benefiting from it who may have not had anything to do with it and recognizing that and it's a wrong but um thanks can max make a comment max yes please yeah thanks um and i'm sorry i've got to jump off after this to go teach myself but you might be surprised to learn that there's actually some interesting game theoretical commentary on the puzzle that you're describing uh, actually associated with the notion of an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And some modern scholars have applied game theory to su suggest that actually the intuition of an eye for an eye doesn't necessarily mean that you're seeking as a remedy the eye, but rather that you're seeking to begin the bargaining process with a change in the valuation from the perspective, perspective of the original victim. So in other words, the idea here is not that you would actually extract the eye, but the victim of the original extracted eye would be in a bargaining position to impose on the perpetrator the subjective valuation as opposed to having it priced by a third party decision maker. The beam example is actually a less painful one to think about. So there are two choices, there are two choices here. One choice is to have the third party decision maker identify the valuation of the stolen beam. The other one is to have the third party decision maker not understand how to precisely value that from the perspective of the victim. And by issuing injunctive relief, saying that you actually have to tear the house down, change the property right in effect for the beginning of the bargaining position. So now the victim can seek to extract a value some be somewhere between what one might objectively measure the value of the BMAT in the tear down of the house in a way that might be regarded as more fair. The problem with all of this, and if you wanna get geeky about it, um, this actually has to do with uh, an insight called the Coase theorem. But if you wanna get, uh, the, the, the problem with this is, and, and, and of course there are anti-Semitic overtones to the Merchant of Venice. The problem is that if you give somebody this kind of a property right as the starting point of negotiations, you run up against the possibility of a sociopath who actually will seek to extract the eye or extract the beam. So you can set up this alternative bargaining structure that gives greater weight to the subjective valuation of the victim, but you have to be aware that when you do that, you invite the possibility of a really dire result if the person doesn't interpret the rule the same way. And it's interesting that there are some Israeli game theoretical theorists that have studied this question this way, which has made me think about these puzzles very differently than the way I was brought up thinking about these puzzles. Anyways, I'll leave it there. Thank you for letting me weigh in. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. And with that, Professor Stearns drops the mic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was amazing. He yeah. teaches constitutional law. <laughs> hey, a lot. Can I also something here about when, when it says the sake of dependence, is this assuming that someone has tried to do chuba for their act of stealing the beam? And the question I'm going to think about is. If I stole the beam and then I used it for something else, and then like I built the building, I'm going to be further embarrassed when the whole residence of that building, like my sin, gets magnified in front of others, seemingly unnecessary. Yeah. And yeah. it feels like in both this one and the previous one, where if the poor person is just walking out and the homeowner is like, oh, well, you're a poor person, it has to be, that you need food for me, right? It's like stealing agency and, and I don't need my sins, my schmutz to be put in the public light. Great. So I think you and also Sally was sort of raising this question earlier is how does this also relate to 
the other facets of repair, including chuva, like the, the, the work of repentance. Um, and also how does, how does that relate to the question of like what's in the public eye? So um, the, the source that Ben mentioned about ayin tachadayin, of eye for an eye, there's a whole discussion in the Talmud uh, about eye for an eye and Max was giving us some game theory on it. What's interesting about the discussion in the Talmud that's different from American law as I understand it is that while in American law there are four categories of damages, in Jewish law there's actually a fifth category and that category is boshet, is embarrassment. So there is an understanding of like what the perception is and, and embarrassment clearly is a negative. Right. It's not like embarrassment is a thing that we use in order to to bring about a just outcome. There are sources in Jewish tradition that say I think there are times where it's necessary. But the rabbis in general are very resistant to the idea of embarrassment as a good. It, it, it almost never leads to anything good and, and more often serves to compound the damage that's already been been done. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more comment on this and then I wanna close with the last text. Okay, so let's go, let's go to the last T, tefillah. And then the question is, you know, given all of this, right? The fundamental linkage between possession and justice and justice that we saw in the first text, the notion of a collaborative model of tzedakah, as a, as a good in and of itself for all kinds of reasons and Shabbat being a good kind of case study of how that might, what that might look like. Um, dealing with the question of like, how do you deal with injustice that exists, right? It could be immediate injustice. The house was built from the stolen beam last week and the beam was stolen We've lost the audio again. Thank you. Okay, so what would, we made the observation that the world is in some ways kind of inherently unjust, right? Society isn't the way we really want it to be ordered. Maybe government doesn't function the way we want it to function or money doesn't you know, flow in the way that we think it ought to flow, right? So you you might look at a, a utopian text like the um, like uh, Yeshayahu, Isaiah, who um, <laughs> describes a world in which the wolf is lying down with the lamb, right? And that baby can play on a hole where there's a viper, and that's the world. Or you might read the discussion in the Torah about the Yovel, about the Jubilee, when you know we hit a reset button and all debts are forgiven and, and those who are enslaved are freed and right, but it's, it's hard to bring about those things, right? We may, so the question is when we can't just snap our fingers and bring them about, what do we do? And in some ways, right, we, we aspire toward them, right? Tefillah, prayer is one way of thinking about that. So I wanna end with a prayer of sorts and it's a prayer that comes from the prophet Amos, which doesn't mean we pray and then do nothing. I think all the things we talked about are the things that we do and, and, and a bunch of others, um, but that we need to kind of understand like our wayfinding and to get to do the wayfinding, you need to know where you're actually headed. So, um, so here's the line, um, you know, popularized by Dr. King, among others, which often is translated, um, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. You'll see here, that's not the translation that I brought. And the reason for that is, is a better translation actually is more useful for thinking about what it is to aspire toward a just society. So first of all, um, the gal, right? The word gal is a is a wave. 
um, it doesn't seem to be that that it's coming from above, right? The notion that justice is going to roll down implies that it's like something that that comes down maybe from heaven toward earth, right? That it, we're sort of waiting for it to, but actually the notion of justice welling up, right? Um, I think is more interesting. Uh, and that does seem to be maybe a more honest translation of the text, but it's the second part of the phrase that I really want to kind of draw our attention to because staka, right? In this case, here it's talking about righteousness, but just another word for justice. There's a a technique in biblical poetry called parallelism, where you say something in the A part, and then you say a version of the something you said in the A part again in the B part. So mishpat and tzedakah here are meant to be partners, um, uh, two different words for justice, essentially. So justice, righteousness, in the second part of the phrase, kenacha etan. And I think it's really important to understand what nacha and what etan actually mean. So there is a word in Hebrew for river. It's not this, okay? The word in Hebrew for river is Nahar. So if you're talking about like the Euphrates River, right? That's Nahar Prat. It is a big river, okay? The Jordan River, less big, is often just called Hayarday, right? It's the Jordan, but it's definitely not called a Nahal. And why isn't it called a Nahal? Because what is it, a Nahal? So a Nahal is a wadi. A Nahal is a, is a dry riverbed um, that is sometimes has water in it, but many times does not have water in it. And it sits there until there's a rainfall and then it becomes a stream. Okay? What's Eitan? Eitan could be mighty. That's a plausible definition. But it could also be constant, right? ever flowing. So what is justice in the prophet's imagination? Life-giving. That it's a constant. Life-giving. Life-giving. Right? Does it wash? Wells things up, things yeah. Hmm? It wash other things away? Maybe it also washes certain things away. Right? So, so the, the image here is, what would it be like if the wadis of society were constantly flowing with water? If we didn't have the constant anxiety of waiting for the rain to fall and the wadi to fill and the ability to then draw nourishment from the nahal, but actually if the nahal were a nahar. Right? What would it be look like if, if the Naha were a Nahar, if the Wadi were actually a mighty river? Okay? Which isn't to say justice is a mighty river, it's to say that we need to ensure that it becomes that, that it becomes that. That's my prayer. Great learning with you. Yeah.